Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome students, legal mentors, and friends of Discovering Justice to Unpopular Speech in Schools. Uh, my name is Henry Schunk. Uh, I'm the program manager for Discovering Justice uh, with our courthouse tours, events, and field trips. Uh, and I am joined here today uh, in the spotlight uh, by our wonderful student co-moderator, uh, Skyla Boyd. And Skyla, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Skyla. Um, I go to Discovering Justice in Mock Trials, and I also am a student at John F. Kennedy Middle School. Hi. Thanks so much. Skyla and I are going to be asking some questions today of our wonderful panelists who I'll be introducing in just a moment. Uh, so before we begin, I want to provide just a little bit of context for our discussion here today. Um, some of you here are like Skyla, our students in our mock trial program, and have been kind of wrestling with and debating this concept of unpopular speech or free speech rights in schools. Uh, and what's protected in terms of speech in schools. But for those of you who are joining us for the first time today, I want to start by posing this question. What is the First Amendment? The First Amendment uh, essentially is part of the Constitution. It protects citizens' rights to freedom of religion, freedom of speech, the right to peaceably assemble, and, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Overall, the First Amendment guarantees the right to say and publish what you want without restriction and to peacefully protest for a cause that you believe in without interference. But what does that really mean? Can anyone just say whatever they want anytime or are there limitations? Today, we're gonna kind of zero in on this question in schools. Uh, schools are different from other forms of public spaces. And so the rules around free speech in public spaces are going to be a little bit different. Whether an opinion is popular or quote unquote unpopular, what you're allowed to say in a school is gonna be different than what you would be allowed to say on say the sidewalk. Um, there's been a lot of debate about this for a very long time, um, but just so you know, this is still a very relevant and, and active issue today. And I'm gonna share two quick news stories um, from just this year about a conflict in a school um, around free speech or unpopular speech. So let's take a look at our first example. Uh, this is from the Boston Globe. Uh, New York Times journalist, Nicole Hannah-Jones was invited to speak to students at Concord's Middlesex School for Black History Month. Hannah Jones is a 2020 Pulitzer Prize winner and the driving force behind the 1619 Project, which is uh, the New York Times examination of the legacy of slavery in the United exactly. States. The school initially said they wanted to have uh, her speak to students in February of 2022, and she accepted that invitation. But shortly after, she was uninvited from speaking at that event. Quote, according to the head of the school and board, the noise around uh, that speaker would take away from the overall experience. Hannah Jones told the Boston Globe afterwards, quote, it's pretty clear that we are in a moment where schools are facing intense pressure not to invite speakers that are considered to be focusing too much on race and racism and the black experience in American history. So there you go. There's an example of a speaker being uninvited from a middle school because maybe their remarks would be considered too controversial. There's another quick example I'll share without going on too long here uh, from MIT and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, this time quoting from the New York Times. Uh, MIT invited geophysicist Dorian Abbott to give a public lecture this year, um, but there was an angry uh, resistance that arose as students uh, had criticisms of this professor's views on affirmative action and diversity programs. Uh, Dr. Abbott said that his planned lecture at MIT would have actually made no mention of any of those things. But despite that, MIT reversed course. The head of its Earth and Atmospheric Sciences Department called off the lecture and uninvited Dr. Abbott. To quote uh, that head of the department, quote, besides freedom of speech, we have the freedom to pick the speaker who best fits our needs. Words matter, 
and they have consequences. So as you can see from our examples here, the questions of what kind of speech is allowed in school, uh, whether that's a middle school or all the way up to a university is still really a relevant issue for us today. And with me here today to discuss this relevant issue uh, alongside Skyla are three panelists uh, who each have a really unique background and approach to this question. Please join me in welcoming Mary Beth Tinker, a former student involved in a landmark Supreme Court case, Tinker versus Des Moines. Please join me in also welcoming Kevin Dua, a teacher here in Massachusetts, encouraging student advocacy to affect social and racial justice change. And last but certainly not least, uh, please join me in welcoming Mike Highstand, Senior Legal Counsel for the Student Press Law Center, an organization focused on student rights to free speech. Uh, we're gonna have some time before the end of today's panel to uh, submit some audience questions and ask things of them. But for right now, I am going to finally stop talking and turn things over to Skyla uh, to get our questions started. Go ahead, Skyla. Okay, um, please introduce yourself. Okay, I'll start. I'm Mary Beth Tinker and I, uh, I live in Washington, DC. I'm a retired nurse. I worked mostly with children and teenagers as a trauma nurse and in schools and clinics. And I was a plaintiff in the case for students' rights called Tinker versus Des Moines. Do you wanna go, Kevin? Let me take it. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kevin Dua. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. I have been an educator for about 10 to 11 years, um, teaching history. Um, I am also a practicum supervisor at Boston College, so helping teaching candidates um, who are working on becoming educators anywhere um, in this country and around the world. And I'm proud to say that a few years ago, I was honored and privileged of earning um, the award of Massachusetts History Teacher of the Year, um, becoming the first um, African-American Black person to earn that award. Um, so it is an honor to be here with everyone that is present today. And, uh, my name is Mike Easton. I am, they call me the Senior Legal Counsel at the Student Press Law Center. Um, you got a quick kind of rundown of what we are, but we're a nonprofit group. We're based in Washington, D.C. I'm actually fortunate to live out in the other Washington, Washington State. Um, and our whole reason really for being in business is to provide uh, free legal help and information to, to uh, student journalists. So, I mean, my specific job, I'm in front of my computer and in phone and stuff all day, uh, just answering lots of media law questions. So we, we hear lots of questions about censorship, uh, but, you know, also uh, folks putting out newspapers have questions about libel and copyright and access to public records records and information. So that's kind of what we do at the center. And thank you for having me here today. Okay, why is it important for student speech to be protected in schools? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. It's so great to be with all of you. I'm very honored to be on this panel. And thanks to Discovery Just Justice. Uh, why is it important? Because young people have to be able to express yourselves. First of all, it's good for your health. It's good for your physical health, your emotional health, your psychological health, all of it, social health. And also, that's how you make a contribution. And you have great ideas and energy and a sense of fairness. And without your contribution, our society is cheated. So that's why it's so important, both for your well-being and for the society's well-being. I would just add to that. I mean, you know, one of the things that I see from from my position, just hearing from from students putting out newspapers and yearbooks and radio broadcasts and things like that, is you all have, you know, young people have a very unique sort of uh, place. Uh, they 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 see the world from a different sort of vantage point. Um, and like Mary Beth said, it's really important that the rest of us, I think 
have you know the have the opportunity to hear you know those sorts of thoughts and and you know where are you coming from i mean the take of a person you know of a 16 year old on climate change is going to be much different than a 60 year old person on climate change and so i think it's really important that we make sure to, to recognize that uh recognize the valuable voice that young people do have and i would say to add on to what has been said um like truly it, it has been a privilege um, over the past 10, 11 years to work with students, to yeah. learn from students, to teach students. Mm -hmm. uh, and on a very simple level, um, as students, you're humans. Um, each of you have your own voice, your own identity. Um, it is not our roles as your teachers, as administrators, as principals, to say that we are empowering you, that we give you voice, because that would be that would be a lie. You have your own voice. You have individual power. And if schools are supposed to be a place to unpack and to hear perspective that could potentially help individuals to challenge, then as students, you make up the majority of an academic space. You are the reason why educators, why principals, why administrators do what we do best. And so it is viable that for students, you feel that what you say can be protected and challenge as well. Um, because if we don't model that, if we don't integrate that, then that invalidates the purpose of what individuals have fought for has sacrificed in terms of recognizing human agency uh, in this country um, as best as possible. Thank you. Where is the line between hate speech and free speech? I'm gonna let one of you two start it off this time. How about that? Kevin or Mike, have some feelings about this? I mean, can't say no to. Um, I will. I so free speech focuses on individuals being able to talk, discuss their beliefs, um, their viewpoint, their ideas, their thought openly. Versus um, hate speech that can incite um, harm, threat, violence. Um, and yes, there are limitations to such freedom. There are limitations to free speech. And just on the basis of that definition, uh, that's a difference. Uh, but when you peel back and, and unpack about the First Amendment, um, about where it originated, about um, who decided um, how, how that would be applied to which demographics and who would be denied or punished when you put that context, it really does pre present a comprehensive um, and in-depth look about power, about humanity. And even though this is 2021, it really does bring up about who is determining what is free and what is hateful, what is harmful. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can get into discussion with the great questions that you all will ask as students um, with the panel, panelists as well. Um, but for me, that's how I have seen and how I've learned as a student and a teacher, the difference or the line between hate speech and free speech. I'll just say what I'm looking for um, when trying to kind of make that determination is, you know, do, is the speech that we're talking about, I mean, are they singling out a particular group of people, you know, for their ethnicity, for their religion, um, and going after them simply for that basis? I think that's, you know, when, when we're uh, talking about, you know, trying to distinguish hate speech from regular speech in the law, that's what we're looking at. Yeah, that singling out of a, of a particular group of people and going after them simply because of who they are. Yeah, it's, it's racist speech, it's home, homophobic speech that's against LGBTQ people, but it's in, against immigrants, Latinx, Native people, women, but it 
are dis all people. Mostly it's speech against people that have been disrespected as groups in our culture, it seems to me. But there really is no legal definition of hate speech. But sometimes you can recognize it when you see it. But where does it cross the line as far as legally in schools? That is kind of a gray area. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And that's why I'm glad all of you students are talking about this and learning about this. Because it's not like there's an expert adult somewhere who knows the answers to these things. So that's why you should learn about it and weigh in also. Because you have your ideas too. I'll just say this, this is not a special uh, problem just for schools. I mean, yeah. every, everybody outside of schools, we're all trying to figure out what hate speech is, what hate, you know, what it's not, how do you regulate it? Um, you know, can you regulate it? That's an ongoing question, yeah. I, I guess I, I'd like to jump in here real quick um, with a question for Mike. You know, are there cases that you know of where, or, or anybody that, you know, feel free to answer this question, even, even if you aren't Mike, but are there cases you know of where that's been debated? Like, you know, this is free speech versus this is like intentionally hateful. Like, are there some borderline cases where that, that we could illustrate, that, that would illustrate that point for the audience here today? If, if you can't think of any off the top of your head, that's, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Please jump in you guys, if you have. I can think of, I can think of one right yeah. off hand. Mike, do you have one? Cause I no, think go ahead, go for it, yeah. The one I'm thinking about has to do with gay issues. There is a school in San Diego where the kid wore a shirt that said, God is ashamed of your homosexuality, okay? The courts ruled that that would not be allowed because it was hate speech and it made the gay kids feel unsafe. Okay, but a school up in, I think, Connecticut, you wore, a kid wore a shirt that said, be happy, not gay. And they decided that was not hate speech. They were just expressing their opinion about it. So see where it can be kind of, you know, hard to decide. Yeah, those are great examples. Yeah, thank you. I think that's I think that's very interesting, and it, and it goes to show why you know students in our mock trial program might still be kind of debating this mm -hmm. line because it can be it can be somewhat unclear. Um, so thank you, Skyland. Thank you, uh, everybody, for for answering those first couple of questions. Uh, we're going to get into it now with just a few. Uh, I guess questions for each of you as individuals, and Skyla and I are going to take turns here uh, asking uh, those questions. But if you have something you want to add, you know, feel free. Feel free to weigh in. We're not going to restrict your speech. Um, so my first question tonight is for Mary Beth. Um, what you know, getting into your story a little bit, what was your experience with the First Amendment as a student? Um, and kind of what led you to um, be involved in this work and, and ultimately to the Supreme Court case? Yeah, the rights of students in public schools today, the affirmation, the strengthening of those rights really grows out of the efforts of black students in the 60s especially, but even before then some, but for example, in 1963, there was a group of 2,000 Black students in Birmingham, Alabama, called the Birmingham Children's Crusade. And they marched and sang and protested against racism. And Martin Luther King was in jail writing his famous letter from Birmingham jail. You can check that out. That's amazing. But the kids were like, don't worry, we've got it. We're going to do this. So they started marching and protest, and they got attacked by dogs and it was terrible. Um, but these kids, they kept on going. Well, the white supremacists who think that white people should always be in charge, the Ku Klux Klan and others, they figured out a really mean way to punish the children. And they put a bomb in their headquarters, the 16th Street Baptist Church, right on Sunday morning. And the bomb went off and killed four little girls. Cynthia, Addie Mae, Carol, and Denise. So what happened was a, the writer, James Baldwin, a very amazing writer, he said we should all wear black armbands all over the country that, that fall when that happened. It was in September of 1963. I had just turned 11 years old when someone came by our picnic and told us what had happened to the girls. 
And so James Baldwin said, we should all wear black armbands all over the country. Just simple black armbands. This is a symbol. It means you're sad that someone died. And so that's what we did in Des Moines. And that was my first experience with black armbands that year. And it was a way of expressing our sadness. And that's an important feeling that kids have and that kids need to express. But then that's how we kind of got the idea later on when the Vietnam War was building up a couple of years later when I was 13 years old. And then we heard about the idea to wear black armbands again. But this time it would be to say that we're sad about the people being killed in the war. So that's how we ended up uh, doing it again. And the principals heard about it and they made a rule against armbands. And then it was really crazy, but it ended up in court and it ended up in the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, yes, kids do have a right to express themselves in public schools. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mary Beth. And, and I guess something, if you wanna elaborate on this a little bit, you know, you weren't saying anything. You just were wearing a black armband. So how is that, exactly. how is that free speech, you know, if you're not yes, actually that, saying anything? That's called symbolic speech, symbolic speech. It's kind of like Kevin Dua, Mr. Dua. You're wearing your message on your shirt. It's a very good message. I love it. You don't have to use your, your, your words. You're not saying anything. You, but your message is right there. So in this case, this was, what was, what's that one, Mr. Dua? Let me see here. Oh, yeah, exactly. The same thing. Some students were telling me last week that at their school, they had been told they shouldn't wear that on their mask for the pandemic. And I said, well, you have every right to express that and wear that on your shirt because the Supreme Court has decided that you, you do have that right. But there's an, uh, something called, wait a second, sorry, symbolic speech. It's a symbol. I know some of you probably have symbols on right this second to say something. It's a symbol. You don't have to say a word. You just have it on. It means you're sad that someone's died. In this case, the black armband, but there are many other symbols in life. Thank you for that. And I think it's important to understand, I guess, for students, you know, yeah. The, the wide variety of, of speech and, and what's exactly. protected in that way. Exactly, yes. Go ahead, Skyla. All right, Kevin, what is the role or responsibility of teachers and school leaders when students decide to voice or um, exercise their First Amendment right to protest? I would say first is as important as teachers, as school leaders, to honor, to validate that the First Amendment right to protest um, applies to students, apply to folks within this country. Um, so there's that. I would also say that it's important for us as teachers and as school leaders to always provide context um, as to not just the power of protests, uh, but why folks protest, especially within this country. Um, I think so often that when students want to exercise um, the right to protest, um, for a lot of people, there's, there's this debate on if they can or they cannot. Um, but there's certain ways to do so. Uh, and oftentimes, um, teachers and school leaders feel that it may be tricky to figure out what is quote unquote appropriate and what is not, what can happen, what cannot. And even presenting that, uh, teachers and school leaders should always be ready for a student to ask, can you define what is appropriate? Can you define what is okay, what is not okay? Because not anticipating, not expecting that students may ask that, it's, it's assuming that students, that you all, regardless of your age, can't think, that you don't speak um, in your head, that you don't communicate with each other, that you don't plan, that you don't understand 
history in your environment. Um, so, there, so that's important to not assume that you all uh, don't know why freedom of, or why the First Amendment right to protest is important. And I think ultimately, and I say this as not only a history educator, but I also say this as a Black American. I say this living in Massachusetts where I know every year tourists will, will go to the Boston Harbor and participate in a reenactment of the Boston Tea Party. Um, about the idea of protesting and how that played a huge role in the American Revolution. Um, and that's awesome. Um, but I also see, and that could be a school doing a field trip. Makes sense. But then teach some teachers and some school leaders may be hesitant or nervous on what to say when students say that they wanna do a symbolic gesture of protesting by taking a knee during the national anthem because they are protesting police brutality and racism in this country that has harmed, that has taken the lives of black and brown people. And I use those two examples because someone could say, what is the difference? Like doing the Boston Tea Party, that's okay um, protesting, that's symbolic, that makes sense. But taking a knee, there's something wrong, is uncomfortable. And if that comes out of the mouth of a teacher or a school leader, they should be prepared that a student could say, what's the difference? especially with a country that believed that such protesting was okay and students honoring that legacy, students honoring the legacy of civil rights leaders in the 50s and 60s, the same leaders from Dr. Dr. King and the Rosa Parks and the James Baldwin that were alive um, when Mary Tinker was in school, the same age, around the same age of you students right now and upholding those values of protesting what is right. And we celebrate these individuals today. So for students, it is clear that they could at any second and rightfully so say, I'm following the legacy of these individuals that we learn in these books that we celebrate in holidays. So it's so important that for teachers and for school leaders that when students wanna exercise their right um, to protest, to not assume that students are not paying attention to what we are teaching from what they're seeing. Because if we do that, we assume that we're not doing a good job as educators. And we're also assuming that students are not um, taking in and understanding. So overall, the role and responsibility of teachers and school leaders is that do not assume that your students do not understand and get the importance of their rights um, to protest, especially those individuals who have been marginalized, who have been suppressed, who weren't thought of when the right to protest, when the Bill of Rights originated in the 1700s. Um, so that's what I feel the importance, um, the role and responsibility of teachers like myself, any teachers listening and school leaders on how to keep in mind that students are fully aware of the legacy of the right to protest. Thanks, Kevin, so much. It's an incredibly powerful answer. And, and, I, and I hope that uh, and you know, teachers and students listening uh, today can can think about that, and and also can you know use their critical thinking to think about the answers that their teachers give them and the reasons schools may provide to them, things like that, and, and debate that amongst themselves. Uh, turning now to Mike, uh, our expert from the SPLC, um, Mike, uh, folks are curious, what does the law actually protect when it comes to student speech? in schools, you know, whether that's K 
case law or, or cases that, that your organization has handled? Like what, what are people allowed to say? And then where is, where is the line, I guess? Oh, you're on mute right now. <laughs> but I'm excited to hear what you were going to say. You would think I would learn after all these months. Um, I first want to say, um, I wish that all my principals were like Mr. Dua here. Holy cow, it would make my job so much easier mm -hmm. to have that sort of respect for, for young voices. Um, so the law's a little, it gets a little complicated. Um, but I will say that, that um, you know, there is a reason that, that Mary Beth's picture and her brother John's picture was in my daughter's uh, history book. Um, because really, everything starts, um, for the most part, with, uh, with their case. Uh, the Supreme Court had, had, had played around, not played around, but they had, had touched on the, the, the idea of, you know, First Amendment protection for students back in the 40s, with this case about, you know, whether or not students had the right not to have to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. But it was kind of a, you know, side issue there. It really wasn't until 1969, when the Supreme Court, you know, had its hand on the Tinker case, that it had the opportunity to address the question very directly. Um, you know, when students are in school, are they protected by the First Amendment? You know, are they citizens uh, protected by, you know, the, the First Amendment's protection of free speech, free, spe free press? Um, and uh, as Mary Beth said, they answered in the affirmative in that case. Um, and it wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't a slam dunk. I mean, there was definitely uh, some talk on both sides of the case. Um, you know, they had some, some disagreements there. And um, they came up with a balancing test. And so the balancing test, and this is, you know, this is, this is 1969 law, but it's important to remember, it's still the law. I mean, it is still a law that is in place and that, that governs uh, much of what students do in, in school. Uh, but basically, students have the right to speak out in school, and we're talking about public schools here primarily. Uh, they have the right to speak out in school uh, as long as their speech um, is not unlawful, um, you know, doesn't invade the rights of others. So we're not, and we're talking mainly here about things like libel and obscenity, speech that invades somebody's privacy, that sort of thing. Um, certain legal categories, honestly, that, that none of us are entitled to, to, to break. We, we, none of us are, have any sort of legal right to, to engage in libel. Um, the category that was unique to, to the Tinker case, though, is that the school said that, or the, the court said that school officials can also censor speech if that speech would create a serious physical disruption of, of normal school activity. So, you know, if you are engaged in speech that, that results in fistfights or class walkouts or that sort of thing, um, school officials can also stop in to protect that or to, 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 to uh, get rid of that sort of speech. So it was really, it's a pretty high bar. I mean, as long, again, as long as you're not engaged in unlawful speech and as long as you're not engaged in speech that creates a serious, and it's not just like hurt feelings or embarrassment. I mean, it's like a serious physical disruption of normal school activities. As long as you're not involved in those two things, you have the right to, to, to speak out. Um, that was 1969. In the years that have followed, the court has has had kind of like a buyer's remorse. It seems like uh, they said, "My goodness, we really gave students, you know, a lot of protection with Tinker back in 1969. We better pull back a little bit." So in 1985, uh, court came a case came down from the Supreme Court that said that students don't have the right to engage in high school students at least don't have the right to engage in profane, uh, lewd, and decent sort of speech. We weren't real sure exactly the sort of speech they were talking about kind of, you know, uh, you know s s but, but vulgar, profane sort of speech. Um, and then the big one that, that happened, for me at least, uh, came down uh, three years later, 1988, with this case called Hazelwood. The, the issue in Hazelwood was what sort of rights do students have when they're working on a school-sponsored student newspaper? Um, the court made this distinction between Mary Beth's armband, which they called non-school-sponsored speech or independent speech. They created the armbands on their own. Um, and the, the newspaper at Hazelwood East High School called The Spectrum, which was produced as part of a class. And there was an advisor that was paid and the, the school paid for you know, a bunch of the printing is printing bill and stuff like that. They said, in those cases where we're talking about school sponsored speech, um, student newspapers, theatrical productions, that sort of thing, school officials can censor where they have a reasonable educational justification for their censorship. Um, and it sounds reasonable till you start to ask yourself, what exactly does that mean? And they really did, you know, uh, sell out student journalists, but, but, but many students um, by saying that school officials could meet that standard simply by declaring, for example, an article was poorly written or ungrammatical or inappropriate uh, for a particular age audience or uh, my favorite. And this is a quote, school officials can censor speech where they determine that it's inconsistent 
with the shared values of a civilized social order. I mean, it's just like, it's craziness. I mean, they, they really did give school officials lots and lots of power. Um, and I'll get back to that in just a sec, because there's been some things that have been done as a result of that. Um, so that was 1988 with school sponsored speech. In 2007, they had an opportunity to, to speak again about what sort of protection the students have. And they said, uh, students also don't have the right to engage in speech that uh, advocates illegal drug use. So that's another sort of carve out. And then, um, and we'll talk about this, I think a little bit later, uh, you know, just this summer um, in, in June of this year, the Supreme Court handed down a decision where Tinker was once again front and center. But the question was, you know, does Tinker apply to off-campus student speech? When students are entirely off campus using their Snapchats and Facebooks and things like that, you know, what sort of control, what sort of authority do school officials have over them um, when they're off campus? We can talk about that, I think a little bit, a little bit later, but that's, that's generally the idea idea. Tinker for, for unless you're working on school sponsored speech, you know, if you're doing your own underground newspaper, you're passing out flyers, or you want to do that sort of thing. Tinker is still the law and it's still quite protective. Thank you for that, Mike. And I think it's really interesting, you know, you sort of see this broad expansion of rights as a result of the Tinker case and then this, this sort of trend of chipping away. And I, and I think that's important mm -hmm. for us to keep in mind. Um, quickly, Skyler, before we move on to your next question, I know a lot of people have joined us uh, since we first got started here. So I just want to reintroduce everybody real quick. Uh, my name is Henry Shunk, Program Manager uh, for Courthouse Programs at Discovering Justice. Um, my wonderful co-moderator here today is Skyla Boyd, a middle school student uh, in Waltham and a member of our Discovering Justice mock trial program. Uh, joining us today as our panelists who you've been hearing these wonderful answers from this evening, uh, Mary Beth Tinker, a former student involved in the landmark Supreme Court case Tinker v. Des Moines, uh, Kevin Dua, a teacher here in Massachusetts, uh, uh, encouraging student advocacy for social and racial justice, and Mike Heistand, uh, senior legal counsel for the Student Press Law Center, focused on student rights to free speech. So welcome everybody uh, who didn't catch the introductions earlier. Um, we're gonna go for a few more minutes here with some directed questions. And then in about five, 10 minutes or so, we'll pitch things over to you, the audience, uh, to ask uh, some directed questions yourselves. Uh, so Skyla, if you wanna go ahead with our next, uh, with our next question, feel free. Yes, thank you. Um, Mary Beth. What made you decide to speak or voice your opinion in school in particular? And what do you think the responsibilities of students are in this space? Yes, what motivated me was strong feelings. And that's something that kids are really good at, having strong feelings. And then I had examples in my life of people who do something about those feelings and take action. And that's something else that kids are really, really good at, taking action. And so it was kind of a combination of, of those things I'd say that motivated. We were so, I was so sad watching the news every day about the way the world was. And I mean, the Birmingham children, they were speaking up for justice and equality and those things that we're supposed to be about and, and look what happened to them. And, and then the war, war, war all the time. And, you know, just now there's just plenty of other things that kids are feeling sad about. And that's another reason why it's so important for young people to speak up and change things that need to be changed. And so I think that's what really motivated us. And but what you. was the second part of your question, Skyla? The second part was, what do you think the responsibilities of students oh, yeah. are in this space? Responsibilities of students. Wow. Um, I'm going to put that back to you. What do you think the responsibilities are of students? Skyla, you're a student. What do you think? Well, I just think that when you voice your opinion, it yeah. gives other students something to think about. And it may help them come up with their opinion, um, as well as teachers, school leaders, too. It doesn't just have to be kids, because honestly, anybody can get an idea from anybody. So I just think that it's very important for everybody, not just students, to voice their opinions or speak their minds, but for everybody, too. Yes, I'm with you. And that's how we 
hear good ideas. And it's very important. I'm glad you said that. I agree with you 100%. Well, thank you both Mary Beth and, and Skyla for jumping in there. Uh, that's great. Um, my next question is for Kevin. Um, because as although you know the five of us here in in the, the zoom stage so to speak we're all very supportive of the things um, that we're talking about about students right to free speech about students challenging power right but not everywhere is going to be like that and i know that there are oftentimes conflicts between students school administrators district leaders etc um Kevin, based on your experience as uh, an activist and as someone who has worked closely with student activists, where might those conflicts occur between students and teachers and administration officials? Um, and how do you navigate that potential conflict? Like if you were speaking to student activists today, how, how would you advise them to kind of navigate those, those butting of heads with, with school administration? I would say one advice that I would give, um, not just as a teacher, but also a former student, um, is I would encourage students to ask the why. Uh, and so often, teachers, Regardless of, our, regardless of what subject we teach, regardless of what grade we're teaching, we always say, we say that it's important for students to think. It's important for students to raise their hand, to ask a question. If they don't know something, if they're confused by something, it's important for them to be curious. Uh, it's important for them to learn from their mistakes. It's important for them to know that they are not expected to be perfect, just like no one is expected to be perfect. And, and I say that because again, we hear that regardless if you hear it in what state you're living in, um, we, we hear it so, students hear that so often. And so I hope students don't forget that when in a situation, when they feel that there is um, tension, when there is a misunderstanding, where there is conflict uh, between um, what students would want to do in terms of speaking their minds, uh, using, try to understand their rights and freedoms versus what schools, school leaders and teachers may say, I think it's important for students to ask the why. So, for instance, if a teacher or a principal says that, um, let's say the mask you're wearing, um, that's not allowed, that's, that's, that, may, that may be offensive. I think a student should ask what's offensive about the color red? And a teacher and a principal may be confused by that. And the principal will say, well, it's not the color of the red or black. Like, oh, okay. Um, so what's what's offensive? And a, a principal may say, but the words, some people may feel offended by the words. And then for the student, you should ask, what's offensive? Is the word black offensive? Is the word lives offensive? Is the word matter offensive? And however they phrase, however they respond, a student should ask again, can you define what offensive means? And why is it offensive here? And so that conversation, which again, we, we say so much in school that we want students to talk with each other, to talk to us, but th that, will, that would lead to a great conversation about about the differences. And again, many schools, many teachers, many principals may feel that there are certain things that should not be, that should not be in schools. Um, there's a time and place. There's certain languages that are not school appropriate, that are not, that are not professional. Um, 
And I say this because and I've had this experience before. I say this because I remember early on as a teacher, when I was starting out teaching, um, a student said a curse word. And I believe I said something, and this was, was a time where I had more hair on my head. Um, and I say that because a teacher, because a student said a curse word in class. And I said, that's not school appropriate. Um, that's, that's not a professional word to use. And I remember vividly this student looked at me and said, well, Mr. Dua, the profession that I want to do when I grow up is the music industry. And the music that you play, even though it may be censored and whatnot, like those people, they're using those words that helps them in their profession. So Mr. Dua, I'm just practicing. I'm just getting an early start <laughs> in my career. <laughs> and that paused me. That actually paused me. I was like, wow. And the student kept asking, like, what profession were you thinking that I can't <laughs> use this word? And I was like, well, you know, in the school setting. And then the student said, well, Mr. Dua, when you were holding books and you bumped into a wall, you accidentally said the same word. Or not accidentally, you say the same word, right? And I, I was like, wow, you're right. And, and that same student also brought up the fact that, Mr. Dua, I understand about words and I'm asking you these questions and I appreciate that you're talking to me because you don't want, because it's important for us to understand as students what you feel is appropriate, what is not. And so I may look at the American flag, it's a symbolic, and that's appropriate, and you may feel that's appropriate because that's, that's in every classroom. But I can also look at you and say, Mithadua, I'm a Native American. And that American flag, the US flag, does not represent the country that my family, my ancestors, uh, that may be celebrated in a few days for Thanksgiving for many people. But for me, I feel that that symbolic gesture is offensive to me. So is that professional? Is that appropriate? Is that school appropriate, even though I'm a student and I'm Native American and this is our land? And I use those real examples because I think it's so important that for students, you ask the why. You, you, you have a dictionary, you Google about like, I'm trying to understand this word and see if there are any similarities to what you think versus what the schools think. And the similarities then this common ground. But if it's differences, because we teach you as students to do this all the time, ask, why is this different? Why, why and, and people in the past, the Mary Tinker of the world, or Mary Tinker herself, the James Baldwin. People in the past, they asked the why. People in the past that looked like me, that looked like our amazing moderator, they weren't allowed to speak. And those individuals did speak because they realize that they're human is important to ask questions on why things are the way they are. Uh, and I think that is so important that as students, if you feel that you can't ask the why in the most perfect place that was built to ask those questions, then as teachers and principals, we're not, we, we don't deserve the title as principals and teachers because we're not doing a good job. So ask the why um, and go from there. Thank you so much, Kevin. I, I, you know, I almost want to make that the tagline, uh, you know, unpopular speech in schools, ask the why. Uh, I, you know, I, I could add that as a subheading. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we are pretty close now uh, to the end. Um, I want to give some time for audience questions. Um, I did 
I, I know Skyla had one more question for Mike, but I see in our list of audience questions here, there's one that's pretty similar. Uh, so if you don't mind a uh, wonderful audience member who asked this question, uh, I'm going to let Skyla ask uh, sort of our version of this question and, and let, uh, and let Mike take it from there. Uh, go ahead, Skyla. Yes. Thank you, Kevin. So Mike, we used to think of speech in schools as words or actions during school, during the school day. Now with technology, speech can include social media, Snapchat, or text in or after school. How has new technology affected the idea of freedom of speech? And has the law caught up to it? No, not exactly. It's trying. It's 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 struggling. It's doing its best, but it hasn't caught up completely. Um, and I'll try and be real brief here in my in my in my answer because I know we're running short on time. The one thing I did want to say is, if there are any student journalists in the audience from Massachusetts, just recognize that the stuff I said about Hazelwood um, actually doesn't apply to you because you have a state law that provides additional protection. So if you are a student journalist, you want to know more about that, you can get in touch with me, and I can talk talk with you more about that. Um, as far as your know, off-campus speech. Like I said, there was a big Supreme Court case. It was there's not been a whole lot of student speech cases. I think this is the fifth one really that's come down the pike. Um, and this question directly answered asked the question: and What sort of rights uh, do students have when they're off campus to to speak freely, to speak without being, um, you know, penalized or punished by by school officials? Um, you guys probably have heard of this case. It was the the F cheerleader case. Um, <laughs> Basically, this 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 uh, 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 freshman um, high schooler um, in Pennsylvania, she had not made her, uh, she didn't make the. Uh, 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 the uh, the cheerleading team uh, as a as a as on the varsity team and so she was very frustrated one day she was just off campus at a convenience store on a Saturday afternoon got out her Snapchat and took a picture of a middle finger and just like told her friends I mean her group of about 250 friends that was all it was intended to because right that's what we do that's how we communicate that's how young people communicate today um, but it was just you know I'm upset I it was kind of a version of what students have been saying for a long 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 time um, she just did it on this new technology um, and so as a result she got suspended not allowed to participate in the, on the cheerleading team went to the Supreme Court uh, the court there uh, basically, unfortunately, they kind of punted. I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, they didn't give us real concrete answers as far as what sort of protections do students have. But what they did tell school officials, they reminded school officials, is that this is different type, type of speech, that when students are off campus, you really do need to take a pause. You need to take a deep breath before you think about going after them. Um, and only in very specific sorts of cases and, and really kind of troubling cases are we going to allow you to go after them. So, you know, if you are engaged in speech that that you know that truly is threatening to somebody or that's cyberbullying somebody or something like that, uh, we're going to allow school officials to continue um, going after you. But you know, if you want to express your ideas, your thoughts on you know a political issue, Black Lives Matter, whatever it is, uh, the court was pretty clear that they're going to give school officials a lot or give students a lot more leeway to engage in that sort of speech off campus. And school officials need to respect those rights off campus as well. So um, one of the one of the things they talked about was just the importance. Uh, the Supreme Court said that the schools functions as nurseries of democracy. Um, and it really is. I mean, we if we are going to talk about the First Amendment and teach it in schools, um, it's important that we, you know, let students practice it. And so I think that's a bit of what was taking place this summer. Great. Thank you so much. I, I think it's fascinating to see, again, another really contemporary example of, of what we're talking about here today and how these struggles are, are really still continuing. Um, Sky was getting some attention in our chat because she has another question uh, that she would like to ask that folks think is a good one. Uh, so Skyla, why don't you fire that off for, for our three panelists here? Um, feel free to, to ask your question. Okay, so my question is for everyone, how does symbolic speech or verbal speech affect you and your family and friends daily life or lifestyle? It affects every part of life. Symbols are very important in expressing the way that we want to change things for the better, expressing our feelings about all kinds of issues, justice issues, how we feel about life, the environment, friends, everything. Right now I have a symbolic thing on. It's Thurgood Marshall, 
the justice, the Supreme Court justice, who's one of my heroes. And so I always wear a picture of his pin. It's a symbolic way of me saying that I admire him and his work and how he stood up for students and he stood up for African-Americans rights and he stood up for, for our democracy. So yes, symbols are very important every day. I would say that um, it, it, it affects my family and us just being reminded of, of um, our environment and the opportunities that we have that um, was different in different time periods. Um, and Mike, I'm talking about that case about um, you know the cheerleader that spoke. Um, I, I, for me, I reminded that a, a great friend of mine, um, who I see as a mentor, um, who a who, um, great teacher as well. Um, I remember him and I spoke about that particular case. Um, and I remember, like, I answered the I, when I heard about the news. I thought, oh, you know, like. Oh, I'm unsure about how to respond. And my friend um, rightfully so challenged me and said that the, the impact of what someone may say um, off school ground does have an impact um, on school grounds. Um, and it's important to understand about how people, how students, how teachers, how principals understand the connection, even if it's through social media. Um, and to not feel that that can't be unpacked, that, that you can't see a different perspective that is. And for me, that was important to hear, um, not just as a history teacher, um, not just as you know, a friend, but as a person. Uh, because for me, I learned something that, um, and I agree, like this sense of understanding that we can learn from different people, especially people that we value, that we respect. Um, because I could have said, you know what? I'm not even going to listen to what my friend said. Um, and I may have missed out on an opportunity from there, especially someone who I respected. So yeah, it affects every, it, it affects what is verbal, is symbolic. Um, it affects because it, it, it allows conversations. It allows a chance to, um, share my thoughts to feel that I have to defend my thought and hear someone else as well. Um, and um, I think to tie in what Star just asked, um, Star asked in the chat room, how far is the student allowed to extend their freedom of speech when in relation to advocating for a specific movement, for example? Um, and I love that question um, because it's, it's, it's even asking the question says a lot about that. I think as schools, um, no judgment to the school you're from star is that we, we, we haven't done a good enough job of that. And what I mean by that is just looking at the question as a teacher, as a history teacher, um, for me, a student just ask, um, how far should they extend their speech to support human rights? That's how I see that. A student asking, is there a limit if I'm trying to say or advocate that this is human rights? And the question and the answer to that is. For many schools, it depends. And that may be hard to hear for some students, many students right now. Um, and if it's hard, if you're confused by that, as I mentioned before, if you hear that, you should ask why. Um, because if you are a student who believes in Black Lives Matter as human rights, that you're following in the footsteps of folks of the civil rights movement, of black and brown folks, 
and you are questioning, is there a limit? Um, and you should ask, why should you limit how you talk, how you advocate for human rights? Does human rights have a limit? And hopefully you get an answer from someone who says that there is a limit. So yes, I, I think that it is it is it is important to ask the questions. It's important to use facts um, because I'm 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 sure that those type of questions of young people during the era of the 40s, 50s, 60s of the civil rights movement, uh, I'm sure they turn to people and ask, "Is there a limit to?" us and what we should be doing for human rights. I'm sure many people said it depends. And I think that's important to just keep in mind that like history shows human rights are important. Uh, and if you center on that, you will always end on the right side of history. So great question, Star, great question. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Star, and thank you to all the panelists uh, for your answers there. Um, I know right now we're a little past 5.30, uh, which is technically the cutoff point uh, for this, um, but I, I wanna just pitch to the, the panelists really quick um, if you'd be willing to answer maybe one more question um, and give the audience the, the opportunity to ask anything uh, sort of left uh, unsaid at this point, because um, I it's my bad. I, I feel like we got to our audience question portion a little behind. Um, so if you all are okay with sticking around just a few more minutes, I, I would love to, to put it back to uh, the chat if you all have any additional questions. Uh, if not, we can uh, sort of uh, wind things up. <laughs> Kevin says, make it tough. I agree. <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Well, oh, I have go. a question. Yeah, go ahead, Skyla. My question is, do you guys think that students should push themselves when they have a strong opinion, but are too shy or uncomfortable to say it? Well, Mary that's, <laughs> that's the one I was just looking at. That's the one I want to answer. Yes, students should push themselves and try not to be shy because I was so shy. I was the shyest person you could ever imagine for many, many, many years. And then I slowly started like expressing myself and speaking up little by little by little and it gets easier. So yes, practice with your friends, practice with people you trust and little by little speak up and, and do it because you know what? It's a good way of life. You get to, you know, say what you feel and it's good for you and you meet interesting people like I'm meeting all of you tonight and some days it's even fun. So yes, do it, practice and you get, it's going to get easier and easier. I'm so glad you asked that question, Skyle. I just, I, I just have to say too that a few years back, Mary Beth and I did this, this cross country bus tour called the Tinker Tour. We talked about her case and everything. So I got to hear her story many times. And my favorite part of her story was where she talks about she woke up the morning, they were supposed to wear the armbands, and she was just so nervous. But she used the little bit of courage <laughs> she had to wear the armband. And I mean, honestly, it changed everything, not just for Mary Beth's life, obviously, but for all of our lives. I mean, using that little bit of courage was all it took to really make lasting um, impact. I, I love that part of the story. I, I agree with what was said about like, um, yes, you should, you should practice in terms of speaking your opinions. Um, and um, you should also practice and being prepared as someone may respond to your opinion. Um, and that's important because someone may say that this is my opinion and I'm gonna say it. 
And you may say, okay, I, I hear your opinion. You know, you vote like you can say it. That's your opinion. Now, either I'm going to share my opinion as well, or I'm going to respond with your opinion with facts. And that's important for you all as students to know that like, yes, speak your mind by all means, um, learn how to feel that what you're saying, you feel like you can back it up somehow. But also don't be surprised if someone responds back. And, and I think that that there's, there's there's always that part that yes someone could say it's my opinion so you can't respond, but someone can say no that's I, I can respond, um, just like you responded as well, um, and, and and I think that that's important because people do think differently, um, which which Maureen asked about how do you negotiate with people who think differently, um, and it's a choice. You can negotiate with people. You could choose to negotiate with people, or you can choose not to negotiate with people. Um, you know, I may I may debate with someone and say that you know honestly, um, fruity pebbles is the best cereal that exists. Um, that is my opinion, or that's facts actually. Um, and someone could say I disagree with that completely. I'm like, okay, we could do that. And someone could also say, you know what? My opinion is that um, because this has been brought up that what Black Lives Matter is dangerous or what Mary Kendra did when um, she was a student, that was wrong. That was offensive. Like she shouldn't, she shouldn't do that. Uh, and that's their opinion. And I could respond, I, I would say, well, Black Lives Matter is, is not dangerous or scary. Uh, and I can explain why um, with facts. And I can also say what Mary Tinker did um, was right. Because in so many ways, literally the role that she played by putting that armband, um, hearing from uh, James Baldwin when he was alive, uh, that played a role and you and I literally having this conversation right now, um, mm -hmm. school grounds. Um, and so I, I think that's so important about like understanding that, um, you know, when students are asking questions, when students think differently, um, it's important for them to understand that their opinions are important and facts are important, if not more. Um, and I think overall, as I'm gonna be a teacher and try to connect this, start asking the question about how is racial politics in modern cases being affected by the Sunday uprising and student advocacy? I will say this because words, speech are important. For me, even though for you all as students being a different age, it may feel, you may see that it's a sudden, as a history teacher, even though I haven't been in this country for centuries, but what I've learned, what I've taught, what I've heard from my students, that young people has always been at the front of advocacy. Um, that is not sudden. It is, it, is as, it is as American as it may come. Um, it is as human as it may come. Um, in recognizing indigenous people who were also at the forefront of advocating for their freedom, for their ideas, for their thoughts. So it's so important to know that as students, when you ask questions, when you participate in advocacy, when you share your opinions, this is not a new thing. Um, you, you are doing what young people, what we are when we were young, no offense to the other folks, um, but what we did as well. Um, so like it, it's, it's, you are on the shoulders of giants. Um, and, and, and I think it's so important to understand that like people did a lot of good work in advocacy before your time. Uh, 
and to learn from them. Uh, and yeah, you, you definitely will be prepared on stating your opinion and then also using facts as well. Great, thank you so much for that excellent answer, Kevin. And you were able to get to the questions I was gonna direct the panel to uh, anyway. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for, uh, for doing that and for your responses. Um, everybody, I'm being told that uh, we, we've got to cut things off now, unfortunately, but thank you so much to our three panelists, uh, Mary Beth, Mike, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us here uh, and our students today to talk about all of these things. Um, can we get a big, can we get so the hands, uh, the hands uh, emojis in the chat for, <laughs> for, uh, for our three panelists? Uh, and then thank you to the audience, uh, all of you students, teachers, legal mentors, and anyone in our Discovering Justice community. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us here today. I want to plug two quick things right here at the end before we sign off. Uh, if you want to hear more conversations like this uh, with uh, about topics in our justice system brought to you by Discovering Justice, uh, you are more than welcome to join us on Wednesday, December 8th for a conversation about restorative justice and its use here in the District of Massachusetts. Uh, we're going to have a really great panel discussion, uh, 4 to 5 30. Uh, Wednesday the 8th, please shoot me an email, hshunk at discoveringjustice.org if you're interested in attending. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, uh, we do have our mock trial culminating events coming up in just a few weeks. We are desperately looking for jurors uh, for that uh, event. Anyone who wants to come and sit live uh, on a jury for our student mock trials. Uh, if you know anyone uh, who would like to do that, please reach out to Malia Brooks, mbrooks at discoveringjustice.org, uh, and she will be happy to set them up uh, in the right way. Uh, once again, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our audience, uh, and I hope you all have an excellent rest of your evening.